This is Middle East Matters on France 24. I'm Hala Mohideen. Coming up in this week's show. Crisis in Turkey as the Russian ambassador is assassinated. We take a look at Aleppo before and after the devastating Syrian war. Plus, we meet the plucky West Bank startups trying to make their way in the business world. But first to Turkey, scene of a chilling assassination this week. Russia's ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, was murdered at a photo exhibition. The gunman, an off-duty policeman, shouted, don't forget Aleppo, as he pulled the trigger and vowed to wage jihad. Well, despite the fractious nature of Russian-Turkish relations, the two countries' presidents have vowed to remain united in the face of this aggression. This crime is undoubtedly a provocation aimed at derailing the ties between Russia and Turkey. Both the Russian and the Turkish governments are determined and will not take the bait. Meanwhile, Aleppo has been in the spotlight again this week after repeated attempts to evacuate civilians from the one-time Syrian economic hub. With the armed rebel opposition losing the city, we take a look now at how four years of civil war have changed Aleppo. The former commercial hub is unrecognisable, as Luke Schregel reports. Ruins and rubble. After four solid years of civil war, the time-worn majesty of what was one of the oldest cities in the world has been utterly destroyed. There's nothing left now of Aleppo's vibrant past as Syria's commercial hub. The contrast between what was and what is stand as testament to the sheer ferocity of the fighting. Alep is the second metropole urban of Syria. With plus than a million inhabitants, the city rivalizes by its activities industrial and commercial with the grand capital du Moyen Orient. Aleppo was this hugely prosperous large town. People may have forgotten, but it was on the Silk Road. And more recently, the bazaar in Aleppo symbolized that richness, since that was where you could find spices, henna, and of course the famous Aleppo soap. That bazaar, once a site of global heritage, more recently fulfilled a role as a battered battlefield hospital where the odour of smoke and cordite replaced the smells of spices and soap. 13 kilometres of blackened and ruined passages fought over between rebel and regime forces. And what of the other landmarks that dotted the city, like its famous citadel? Before the Civil War, it was one of the Middle East's most famous tourist attractions. Thousands walked its venerable walls every year, built in the 13th century and destroyed in the 21st. Its fortified stone walls were no match for modern weaponry. That was the gateway to the citadel everyone knew so well. Author Mary Sura spent the first 17 years of her life in Aleppo. You can't measure the pain. I'm living in perpetual grief. I've lost everything over there, my past, my city, my friends, everything that was mine and everything that was everyone's. It took just four years to reduce this once bustling metropolis to rack and ruin, from its ancient Grand Mosque to its contemporary shopping malls. Syria's second city isn't even a shadow of its former self, and it'll likely take far, far longer to regain the stature it once held. Well, it's time now for a look at what's trending across the region. Julia Seeger is with us this week. Hello to you, Julia. Yeah. Siri, of course, has been dominating the social networks this week, in particular because of an incident at the UN 
with Syria's ambassador to the UN was caught lying. That's right. It's an information coming in from our France 24 observers team. Uh, during an emergency UN Security Council meeting, several countries accused Syria of conducting massacres against civilians in the eastern part of Aleppo. And Bashar Jafari, the Syrian ambassador to the UN, well, denied uh, the charges like he's done before in the past. But this time he went so far as to show this picture, saying, look at this picture. This is a Syrian soldier in Aleppo uh, kneeling down to help this woman escape the violence. But the problem is, Hala, is that this picture wasn't taken in Syria, wasn't taken in Aleppo. It was taken in Iraq during the battle to retake the city of Fallujah back in May 2016. Uh, and we know this because it was uh, broadcast by several media back in the day. So this, um, this soldier is not a Syrian soldier. It's an Iraqi soldier. The scene happened in Iraq and not in Syria. OK, let's move to some good news now uh, for Syria. In particular, the young girl Bana Al Abed, the uh, young Syrian girl who's famous for tweeting. That's right. The seven-year-old attracted international attention when she started tweeting with her mother about the difficult conditions in which she lived in the besieged city of Aleppo. And I don't know if you remember this, but she even called on the Turkish uh, prime minister to hold the ceasefire so that she would have time to get out of the city with her family. And uh, Erdogan even answered her uh, not long ago. So, And it now seems like her wish has come true, because according to several NGOs on the ground, she was able to escape with her family, and she's now safe. And she was uh, interviewed by a Syrian uh, journalist called Adi Al Abdallah. We're going to listen to her now. Bana there has more than 300,000 followers on Twitter now. And let me just say that some critics uh, are saying that we don't know much about this little girl and we should be cautious because all of this could just be propaganda material. Indeed, as with many things coming out of uh, this particular conflict, better to be safer uh, rather than sorry. Well, let's uh, move to a final story now in Israel, where around 10 to 15 women were denied entry to the parliament building for dress codes reasons. That's right. A dozens of parliamentary aides wearing skirts protested in the entrance hall of the Israeli parliament after several of their colleagues were denied entrance to the building where they're working just because their dresses or their skirts were deemed too short. Now, many of this, these women say that in the last couple of days they had noticed that security officers were trying to enforce stricter dress code uh, in the building. Now, in the protest, there were also some men. You don't see them in the picture right here. But one man, one MP, stripped down uh, to his vest to show his support. You can see him here on the video. There has been a, a dress code for, for quite a while. But now what women are asking is, how short is too short? Are they going to start measuring our skirts? Um, so, But no matter what, lawmakers have now discussed the issues. And they've decided to halt efforts to enforce uh, a stricter uh, dress code. So it's a story we're going to have to follow up on. Certainly is. Thank you very much for that. Thank Julia you. Seeger taking us through the stories trending on social media. Now, at first glance, Mashvisor is just one of thousands of websites specializing in U.S. real estate. But there's little American about it. In fact, this is the latest in a series of projects starting in the West Bank and being run from Israeli-occupied Palestinian territories. Mash Visor is a website specializing in U.S. real estate. But it was created in the West Bank and is run from the Israeli-occupied Palestinian territory. It's the first Palestinian company to receive backing from the U.S. venture capital fund, 500 Startups. That makes it a pioneer. But other startups are emerging in the occupied Palestinian territories. About three years ago in Palestine, we started working about a, with an idea about real estate Airbnb data, actually. Um, and then from there, a year later, I met my partner, Jabrini, Mohammed Jabrini, and we started working on it together, and it kind of evolved into more than just Airbnb, it evolved to more of a kind of a real, real estate platform. The Palestinian tech sector lags behind Israel, where companies in Tel Aviv's startup scene sell for tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. But they are eager to grow. Red Crow monitors the security situation in Israel and the Palestinian territories. Founded three years ago and run from a small Ramallah office, its clients already include UN agencies and diplomats. For nearly a month, we've been working on an assessment to enter the market in Egypt. 
Our software is already built to expand, meaning we took into consideration that it will work in any country in the world. Several investment funds support these budding businesses. Ibtikar has invested around $800,000 in 10 startups so far. Some good ideas were dying because they couldn't access funds. So that's, we decided then to open Ibtikar and create this, uh, close this funding gap and be able also to provide management support to the companies. Shadi Shan, the director of the Leaders Startup Incubator, sees the companies as a solution to unemployment in the Palestinian territories, where over one out of four people are out of work. The startup market in Palestine is growing fast, and unemployment is lower than in other industries. In startups, if you have good skills, you can make profits, very good ones. With no governmental support, Palestinian startups face many challenges. Despite that barren environment, the West Bank business scene is still looking for ways to flourish. Well, we'll finish up in outer space, where French astronaut Thomas Pesquet still has access to his Twitter account. He's been tweeting images from above, and this one here has been going viral. It's a bird's eye view of Egypt's the Sinai and the Red Sea. Winning combination. We'll give him a follow to find out more, and do follow the Middle East Matters team. We're on Facebook and Twitter as well for more of the best reporting from around the region. Back at the same time next week. See you then.